Hello and welcome to the 4T Podcast. My name is Austin. And I'm Brian. And today we're going to talk about the most fun thing in the world, driving. <laughs> so, driving in Japan. Brian, how do you feel about driving in Japan? Well, I would have to say if there was one thing in Japan that could possibly be the bane of my existence, driving would be it. Yeah, driving in Japan is can be a little bit hairy. So, we should probably start off with the legal driving age in Japan. Uh, so, what do you know the legal legal driving age in Japan? I'm pretty sure it's 18. It is 18, yes. Um, and prior to getting your license, most Japanese people are encouraged to do driving school. Do you know anything about the driving school? I do know that it is a long, strenuous process. And doesn't it cost something like, like, three thousand USD, like somewhere around there or it more? It is. Uh, for most of the driving schools, it does cost around two thousand five hundred to three thousand US dollars. But if you go through the process of doing that, you do get a break in your insurance after you become a driver. Right. Yeah. So it's a pain, but it's worth doing it. Right. Well, I mean, the other thing is, is like at the driving school, I mean, it isn't just like sitting at a desk and taking notes and writing answers, even though that is a big part of that it. That is. They have the, uh, what is it, the driving area the driving outside course. of the school. Like, you know, for most of us, like from the United States, we just, you know, at high school, we had like our driver's ed course where we do a little bit of uh, like in, in, in class knowledge mm -hmm. and we go out and get in the car and drive around town. Well, not in Japan. No. In Japan, you have a driving course. Yeah, the driving course, it is the same, pretty much the same throughout all of Japan. There is a course, a giant loop set up with a small town set up in the middle. You have S curves and L curves and your little yellow cone set up everywhere. Um, you have an incline as well. And they have four main tests set up. There's the automatic transmission, manual transmission. There's motorcycle and large truck uh, tests that use the same yeah. course. Most and of the time. on site, they have, I think, at least two or three working stoplights. That's correct. Yeah, they do. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. So, did you have to take the driving test? Oh, yes, I did. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I have my driver's license. I've got my Japanese driver's license. But um, taking the. That, but we should really talk about um, before we get into us taking like the test. We should really talk about like uh, the uh, license transfer process. There you go. Between uh, from uh, a foreign country to Japan. So uh, Japan does have a bilateral agreement between some uh, countries like Europe, South Africa, and other countries where they drive on the left side of the road. So when you come to Japan, you can pretty much just apply for a license and get it without taking a test. But if you're from a country that drives on the right side of the road, what's the process that you have to do for that? Oh, so from what I heard, there was the whole thing about driving on the right side of the road, but one of the other things that someone had told me that was working at a, um, at a driving school mm -hmm. was that uh, the Japanese government had went to Canada before going to the United States to get the uh, to do all the regulations for driving. And what they found out is that the 13 provinces in Canada have all different, like a little, slightly different driving rules. And what happened was is that they had to go and go to each individual province and get each individual set of rules, which took them about two years for each province. Oh, wow. So they went and they finished all 13 provinces of Canada and they looked to the United States and saw 50 states and like, what is it? however what is it like four or five u.s territories something like that yeah and they're like oh hell no <laughs> is what they said and they're like you can just you know when you get your license give your passport information and just take our test when you get here yeah yeah so there was like a, like a 26 year long process of them trying to process all of the different driving rules for each province in canada <laughs> so yeah uh so the test that you take when you um, and you have to take the test. There are two different tests. There's the writing, the written test, and the driving test. The written test is about oh, 10 questions, and barely goes over any of the signage in Japan. And then there's the actual driving test. Don't forget the eye test that they make you take. There you go, the eye test as well. 
Um, the eye test is a normal eye test, uh, but they use the Japanese system where they have the C that points up, down, left, right, that is increasingly smaller and smaller. Yep. That you have to do. But uh, don't forget that when you have to take this test, you also have to pay a certain, like, get... Don't you have to get certain tax stamps? You have to get tax stamps. You can't pay with cash in Japan at some legal places like the immigration office or right. the uh, driving place. Sorry. Um, you have revenue stamps, they're called, and you have to go to a post office and buy them, then bring them to the... Uh, driving now if I remember correctly it was 6,500 yen which roughly spends like $65 USD and if I remember correctly I had to get three specific stamps there were three distinct prices and if I had anything other than that they would not accept it and the the process is you have to make an appointment and if you don't have all your T's crossed and your I's dotted and you don't have the right stamps they will send you home and you'll have to make another appointment for months down the road and don't forget that the what is it did you go to the the rifu driving school like the the one that's right outside rifu near like tomia there i have been down to that one yeah yeah okay so at that specific location like from from like near sendai um, the only time you can come in as a foreigner to take this test is between noon and one o'clock. Yeah, some of the places that they do they do the test out are very specific and very strict on the times that you can come in and the t times that you can do the tests. Yeah. So I remember there was somebody that came in like five minutes after one o'clock and they're like, no, go home. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're very strict and they're very strict on the test as well. I think... The record number of times someone has taken a test that I've heard of is 17 times. Yeah. 17 times times, what, $60 each time? That's a small fortune. Yeah. Especially for someone living in Japan. Yeah. There was one girl that was there that uh, when I had gone there, I think it was my third time taking the test. Uh, that girl had been there nine times. Oh, wow. And she had done seven on manual transmission. And then her company said, just just do automatic. And she had failed twice on automatic at that point. But. Oh, wow. Well, and that, that brings up the point of how is it possible that you fail? And it has to do a lot with the cars that they use. Uh, you're not allowed to use your own car at the test. You have to use their cars. And their cars are pretty much defunct taxi cabs that yep. no one wants anymore. They are boats, pretty much. They're massive, and so you get in the car you've never driven before, and you have to you have to go around the corners at you know 50 kilometers an hour, staying so close to the edge, and you have to go through all the different things without hitting anything or going over the speed limit, and it's very difficult. Yeah, no, it's very difficult, and one minor mistake, and they will just fail you. Now, a funny thing is, is that the people that work for this driving school, now the driving school is also a place where you get your license and so the government basically subsidizes the driving school for you to get your license so because it's kind of like a private enterprise that offers a public service they fail you many times to make extra revenue they do and if you're a foreigner they will they will fail japanese people they will be very strict on them but because you're a foreigner i mean they will be a lot more strict well, they what, tend to be a lot more strict. What they want you to do is they want you to actually pay the $3,000 for the $3,000 course. And they are going to get money out of you some way or another. Basically. One way or another. Yeah. One way or another, they're going <laughs> to get a certain amount of money out of you. Now, anybody who has taken the course and then takes the driving test at the very end, miraculously, they all pass the first time. Oh, yeah. But if you don't take the course... You've got a battle on your hands. Yeah. Yep. For me, taking I took the test, was it six times in yeah. total? And I remember the reasons that they failed me were I wasn't I wasn't seven centimeters away from a turn, from the curve during a turn. I accidentally got too close to a yellow cone. I didn't do a safety check before. I remember when I got my license, 
I finally got fed up with it and I, I shaved, I wore a suit, I slicked my hair back, I used as much Japanese as I could. I did a safety check and finally when we stopped, the guy looked at me, sighed, and gave me the paper and said, be careful out there. Yeah. After six, after six times. So it's, it's a little bit of a battle. Yeah. When I, uh, before I came to Japan, I worked for, uh, what is it, the security monitor program at the University of Minnesota. And I had uh, one of the higher positions in there. And we actually had a squad car because we were like a subsection of the uh, police department there. Oh, wow. So I was used to driving around in a squad car. So zipping in and around corners, t getting into like tight spaces that had maybe a few centimeters on each side. Totally normal for me. And traveling at higher speeds, totally normal for me. And some of the, the cars we drove were boats. So the first time I got into the car and I drove, um, I was cruising right at the speed limit all the way around, coming to a stop, stopping correctly, doing stuff. But they had what's called the crank and then the S-curve. Yeah. Now the crank is basically three 90 degree angles, or two, is it two 90 degree angles? I think it's one, two, three, I think it's two. Two 90 degree angles, and then there's the S-curve, which is like the size of a bike path. Now, if you can imagine taking a taxi, or basically a boat, on a, on a bike path that makes an S, and trying not to go over the sides, it's pretty difficult if you've never driven a boat before. But for me, like, I think I did that thing at like, 20 kilometers an hour oh, on both the crank and the S curve. And the mm -hmm. guys, I had two people in the car. Like, I think one of them was a trainee and the other one was like the actual instructor. And I think they were freaked out at the speed as I was going. <laughs> so they failed me right away. They said, you went too fast around the S curve and the crank. And I'm like, but I didn't hit anything and I did it correctly. <laughs> They're like, no, you need to do it slower. <laughs> yeah, and then I was the opposite. I went, I'm horrible at that. And with that boat of a car, I. I went as slow as I could and kind of went slow and they failed me because you're going too slow. Yep. So they're very strict. It was very interesting to take that um, that test. All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to uh, what is it? Uh, shaken. Oh, wonderful shaken. Mm -hmm. So shaken, it, it's a it's a compulsory safety check that you have to do every two years for your car. And the shaken will run you about 100,000 to 200,000 mm -hmm. yen. So what exactly, what do they do in the shotgun? Or do you know, do you know the specifics of a shotgun? Well, I know that it all, de it's all de determined on what year your car was made. So if you buy a car brand new, usually that first shotgun is good for three years. But if your car, I think they recently changed the rules on it where it used to be 10 years old, but now it's been moved back to 12. Okay. So if your car is over 12 years old, you have to buy that same shotgun every year instead. That sounds about right. Yeah, I think I remember hearing something about that. So so it's like three years for brand new cars, and then it's every two years after that. And then after the 12-year mark, it goes to every year. So a lot of times in Japan, you'll see cars that are 12 years old that may not have a lot of miles on them, but they'll be dirt cheap. But that shotgun is something you have to pay every single year. Yeah, and going off of the shotgun, you have the 100,000 or 200,000 yen uh, tax that you have to pay. And then there's also a weight tax as well. So if you have a small car like a Honda Life, your tax isn't that much. But if you have a larger car, like an El Grand, El Grand or a, what is it? One Vel the, Velfire. Ooh, the Velfire. Yeah, you, you will be charged anywhere between 8,000 to 50,000 uh, yen additional tax on the shotgun as well as um, any auto insurance that you have right. on your car. So it can run if you're unlucky enough to have multiple cars in your family and you get the shotgun on the same year, it can be a little difficult. Right. The other thing is, is that like if you're living in Tokyo or you're living south of Tohoku, because we're the two Tohoku teachers talks, um, if you're living south of Tohoku, usually you don't really need a car. For the most part, if you live in a larger city, yeah, if you live in a larger city like Saitama or Tokyo or any, any large city, you really don't need anything. Even Sendai. Well, even, yeah, if you live in Sendai, 
if you live outside of Sendai, even a couple miles, yeah. you need a car. Yeah, yeah. But with the with the public transportation in Japan, the buses, the taxis, the subway, everything else, you can pretty much get around without it. Right. Like for the areas that we live in, you definitely need a car to go anywhere. Yeah, we live in what would be called the Inaka in Japan. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, for the United States, it's kind of like the Kansas of Japan or the Nebraska of Japan. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the stakes. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the shotgun is something that you definitely have to be aware of when you come to Japan. Another thing you have to be aware of is the people driving the cars. There's a lot of things that, a lot of dangers yeah. that go into driving in Japan. Yeah. One thing that I have noticed, and, and I, I really think this is true, is that being from the United States, I mean, there's a certain level of offensive driving that you have and a certain level of defensive driving you have when you drive. I personally feel that with driving school, they teach Japanese people to be 100% defensive. It seems that way, yeah. It really does seem that way. And with 100% defense means that you're first priority is to make sure every bit of your own personal needs on the road are taken care of <laughs> and your worry about the flow of traffic and making sure that everybody is traveling at a at a decent speed comes second to your own personal needs yes um one of the major common dangers that you'll see is speeding on the road um especially going through the intersections um uh, going through the intersections when the light's turning yellow or when the light is even red, especially out in the Inaka, the sticks, the country, you'll see that a lot. Yeah. Another thing that you'll find is like, especially for me, like in, in the United States, whenever you'd come to a stoplight and it would turn green, pretty much everybody takes their foot off the gas so everybody rolls forward at the same time. Not in Japan. <laughs> What'll happen is, is that you'll come to the light it'll turn green and the the first car will go and the car behind it will wait at least 10 meters for that car to get 10 meters in front of them before they go and then so forth and so forth so a light that in the u.s would get maybe 15 cars through might only get seven in japan so that's why a lot of times you'll see a lot of backed up traffic is because people are not following the, what the flow of traffic should be yeah, they do. They do have a tendency to slowly go through and s take it slow through the intersections. Or turns. Turns, yeah. Turns are very, are very slow. And, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's a couple turns I've seen people taken that they ha were going so slow that they were still applying the brake for <laughs> just having their foot off the gas. Yeah, and of course, on busy intersections, that's that's understandable, especially if there's pedestrians that might be coming through. But if there's nothing like that, no pedestrians, no nothing, you can go straight through. But right. Japanese people have a tendency, especially older, the older generations have a tendency to go the same speed as a snail. Yeah, we should talk about like the the, the novice level um, markers for the cars. And then there's the, what is it, the expert level. And then there is the, what is it, I don't want to call it old, but it means old, wow. basically, an old driver. Yeah. Um, so in Japan, when you get your, when you're a new driver, you have, well, any kind of driver, you have markers for your car that you have to put on the front and the back of your car. Yep. If you don't, you can get a ticket. So the beginner... The beginner marker is yellow and green yes. for the most part, and it looks like an arrow. Yes. A long arrow, and you put it on the front of your car and the back of your car, and it's in, an indicator to tell everyone, hey, back off, I'm new at this. Right. And you have to have it on your car, even if you're a foreigner, for one solid year, and then after that you can take it off. And then there's another one that looks like a teardrop, and that one is red and yellow, if I'm not mistaken. I believe so. And that one means like I think you've been driving for like 30 years or 35 years. Something it's like something that. It's al something along those lines and that you've had a basically a perfect driving record that whole time. Now going off the, going on a little bit of a tangent here is the color of your license. Um, if you have never had an accident 
um, you can get a gold license. Yeah. Um, the gold license means you've never gotten a ticket or you've been driving long enough that your record has kind of gone long enough that it's not on record anymore. Right. Uh, when you begin, you're a green or blue. You, you s hold on just a second. Let me get my license. There we go. Because oh, I had see? mine. I had mine changed. Oh, okay. So when you start, you get green. Okay, green then. Blue, then, then gold. Blue. I think it's the blue strip that's right here. There you go. So that will go. That kind of goes along with the markings on your car. And then there's a last marking, which is for. It's. Well, there's the four colors. It's like yellow, yeah. red, green, and blue. Something like that, yeah. And basically, that means that you're oh, you're you've been driving for 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. It, I believe so. Yeah, it's a, you've been driving for a long time, or you're an, an older right. driver. Yeah. Right. So, for those of you that like to drive at normal speeds and like the flow of traffic, the best way to describe them is your novice level one means that this person may stay at a four-way stop until every other car has gone through before they turn. So basically, yeah, they're just going to be, they might be incompetent. There you are, that's a good way to put it, yeah. And the, the next level, the expert level, means that that person is only gonna drive the speed limit. And that person is only going to follow the rules exactly the way that they're written. There we go. Sorry for the background noise. The, <laughs> if you can hear the background noise, we've got Edelweiss in the background, and that just means that it's uh, it's noon right now. <laughs> All right. And then finally, your last marker means that this person has absolutely no regard for any rule <laughs> whatsoever, and they're going to drive any damn way they please. And with that marker, usually that means the cops are not going to pick them up. So does that mean that most taxi drivers have that mark? Yes, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, like, yeah, that's... But I... No, Especially when you get out into the boondocks where the two of us live, you see a lot of older drivers. You see a lot of, uh, of drivers with that mark on their vehicle. Now, these people may come to a red light and there'll be no traffic going the other direction and they'll just scoot right on through the red light. No problem. It'll be one of those things, yeah, they need to make a left turn, they're at a stoplight, there's no one coming, they'll just turn. Like, if... It's something the light is turned yellow and they're still far away and then all of a sudden it hits red, they'll still go through the light. Yeah, and if they're if they're still going, they'll they'll keep going. Unless they unless a red light is stopped right in front of them and they're they're stopping, they will just keep on going. Yep. And heaven help you if you need to merge into any lane on like the like the Japanese interstate. They will not get over. Or, and they will not get out of the passing lane either. That's true, yeah. Well, talking about the Japanese interstate, are there any toll, tollways in Japan? Yeah, they're pretty much all tollways. Yeah. 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 So, um, the, there are tollways in Japan. Uh, most of the public roads are, you have no, actual toll where you have to stop and put tolls in but when you get onto the expressways or onto the highways that's when there are are tolls that you will you will find and both of us are from the united states and anybody from the united states who thinks your tolls are high <laughs> you're full of crap you have no idea you are full of crap <laughs> so what um talking about tollways and expressways what what is the speed limit in japan is there a national speed limit? No, I don't think there's a national speed no. limit. It's all pretty much, I think every prefecture has a different speed limit. Yeah, it's pretty much the Autobahn for yeah. the most part. Um, I know expressway speeds, um, the marked speeds that people are supposed to go are is anywhere between 80 kilometers an hour to 100. But you'll be driving down that and there'll be people going either super slow or super fast. They won't really pay attention to that right in uh, urban areas it's supposed to be 40 kilometers 40 to 50 kilometers an hour and anything in the rural, rural areas is 30 yeah but like we said no one actually pays attention to that yeah and so for when we're talking about when we're saying the people are saying the tolls are too high and they're full of crap uh, to go from Ishinomaki to Sendai is I don't know about 30 kilometers 
It sounds that sounds about right. There, it's between thirty and forty kilometers, which is like twenty-five miles or so. Yeah. Um, on that stretch there, that is eight hundred yen for a K car. <laughs> <laughs> like, and that's just one way. Yep. Yeah, so it can get kind of expensive with the tolls. Another expensive thing is gas. And yeah. Getting gas. Well, let's take a quick break, and we'll come back and talk about that. Okay. And we're back, and we're going to be talking about gas next. Okay, so one one thing that's kind of different from America or Western countries that, well, kind of different, is the gas stations. In Japan, there are, uh, traditionally, the gas stations are full service, but as time, time has gone on, there's been more self-service gas stations that have come up, um, come into existence. So... Personally, I like the full service gas stations. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because well, that's all there is really where, yeah. where I live. Which which do you like, the full service or the self service? I personally, I like to do the self service. Uh, one of the main reasons is is a lot of times they'll try when you ask for a full tank of gas and they ask you how what, what do you want and they're like, uh, we want montan, meaning a full tank. It's a full tank. Sometimes they will put extra inside there and fill it farther than you should. And I know from experience, uh, filling a gas tank farther than you should, that if you don't have far to drive after that, uh, you can wreck your fuel filter. So for me, sometimes I don't like going to the, uh, the full service unless I have far to drive after that. Exactly. Another uh, one thing about going to the full service is when you pull in, there will be an attendant who will say, all right, all right, all right, which is all right, all right, come on, come on. Mm -hmm. And they'll direct you where to go, and then when you when you pull up to the pump, you'll turn off your engine, roll down your window, and they'll take your card or ask, ask regular diesel, high octane, or kerosene. Um, and then they will go and fill up your tank. One thing that I like about the full, the full service is the the uh, trash service that they'll do. They'll yep. take your trash, they will empty out your uh, ashtrays if you smoke. And they'll also give you a towel to wipe down the inside of your car, depending while, on where you go. Yeah, while they wipe the windows outside for you. That is one of the good, that is one of the good parts about going to the full service. Um, so where I live, all the pumps are grounded to the are on the ground. Yep. But there, that's not the only kind of gas station in Japan. Yeah, there was a couple that I went to. There was a few in Ishinomaki that I know of, and there's a few in Sendai that they have them drop down from above, and then they put the gas in. That way, no matter where you park, when it's dropped down above, even if you're parked on the opposite side, they can still pull it down and put the the gas in, whether the pump is actually on the left hand side or the right hand side. Yeah, that's something I always. I don't have any where I live, but when I see them, I always, I always like watching the people. Yep. Because when you walk, they either have a string, like a pull string on a light, that you can pull it down, or it's automated, so they can press go it. and then press a button and it'll come down, which is pretty interesting. Well, the one thing you should also keep in mind when you're going to these, whether they be full service or self service gas stations, is that the gas stations are kind of like an old Sinclair gas station or an old Chevron. <laughs> so it doesn't have a convenience store on the inside. They may have a vending machine where you could buy drinks, but usually they do brakes, tires, gas, and uh, like I think they change oil as well. Some, well, it depends on where you go, yeah. Well, like the Dr. Drive that they have for the Ineos. Right. Gas stations. I think they do tires, brakes, and uh, I think they do tune-ups as well. I believe. I believe you're right. And yeah. oil changes. Yep. And most gas stations. Well, most of the larger gas stations will also have a kerosene station as well that yep. you can get. Uh, people in Japan still use kerosene heaters um, because there's no central heating for the most part in the in the homes. So right. people have the wall-mounted air conditioners, and then they use kerosene. Uh, heaters for the houses so you can get your gas and then go fill up your kerosene as well. Yep So that's one that's one thing. Oh also uh, Usually when you pay if you're doing self-service and you're paying for gas 
um, they'll ask you like if you want a full tank or if they if you want to pay money so if you just want to pay money and you have a certain amount you want to put in you can put that dollar amount in now if you have leftover after that you're going to get a receipt but the, the machine the pump that you put the money into is not going to give you your change then you have to take your receipt over to a special change machine and get it scanned and then you get your change yeah all very confusing if you don't under if you can't read right. japanese right so. it took me a long long time to figure that out i think i may have walked you know left money in the right. in the gas station several words times. words that you should know is the keen or gein or no keen yeah, the keen. one the character for gold which means that you want to pay money <laughs> There's also, uh, what is it, mon for like montan? Yes. Learn that one. That one just means full for full tank. And then otsuri. If you yes. can learn those three words, you can go to a gas station. Or those three characters, yeah. or those character sets, you can go to any gas station and get gas without any problems. Yeah, if you if you do know the basics, it's no problem getting, getting gas in Japan. But there is one thing that you do need to know a little bit more for and that is parking in oh. the big cities <laughs> so um, if you live out in the in the country where we do parking is no big deal you yeah. can pretty much park on the side of the road um, park at a supermarket yeah park on a supermarket park anywhere really um, and you'll be fine but going to the city of course Japan spaces at a premium oh yeah so they have to get creative with the parking so if you're parking during the daytime, it is highway robbery. <laughs> if you're parking at night, it's actually reasonable. Yeah, yeah. Um, parking, parking is generally around 100, 100 yen an hour or more, 24, no, 600 yen. In Sendai, I know it's, uh, some of the cheaper ones are about 600 yen per hour. Um, and then you can do 24 hour parking as well. Right. And there, there are some like if you are in in the ab like the the business district, like the shopping district, you are going to pay out the nose <laughs> for 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 parking, and that's just the price in Sendai. It's almost double it or triple in Tokyo. Yeah, that's why a lot of people don't have cars. <laughs> They're yeah. smart. Um, so there are a lot of different places to park in Japan since uh, since space is a premium. They have to get creative so of course there's regular parking spaces where it's all asphalt and you park and you pay at the meter there's also a bunch of different variations as well what are the some of the variations you've seen for parking lots parking lots oh there's the the ones where you uh where they have kind of like a, a, a rotary parking so basically you park your car in the center and then there's two levels of cars that roll around in a circle like this. And when you're ready to get your car, you put in your ticket and it rolls all the cars till you get to your number. You get in your car and you drive out. Which is, it's really cool if you ever get the opportunity to see it, if you get the people to leave the door open. Sometimes they will, if you ask, they will leave it open and you can watch the cars go up and down. It's just a giant carousel of cars, which right. is amazing. Um, and generally it's, five or six stories high yep which is it's an incredible the amount of cars and it's five or six stories high but sometimes it even goes down underground and yeah. comes back up after it's that. amazing like so you might you might have like it go up five or six stories but it also may go down three or four stories at the same time and one thing that a lot of these places have is when you when you drive in you get out of your car and it'll go up and then when you drive out there's a circle a giant circle on the on the ground and what that is is that is a turntable for your car so yes. you'll, you'll the people will say all right all right all right and they'll stop you in the middle and you'll just rotate they'll rotate your car 90 100 180 degrees so you can just pull out without having to drive yep in reverse which is amazing yep there's also the double decker um parking where, where you'll see two cars one parked up on top one parked on the bottom um just sprawling out for ever yeah that's an interesting one as well yeah and um with that one there usually the one car will be able to go underground with the other car so and i've noticed that a lot of times with apartment complexes especially ones that have like high dollar condos or high dollar um 
uh, like just living areas that they have those four people with like expensive cars. Yeah. Um, and actually, going off of that with high, high end apartments and condos and whatnot, in some places in Tokyo, the garage is actually connected to your condo. So you can sleep in the same room as your car. Yeah. Which is very strange to me. I'm not a car person, but. Right. To each his own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, talking about sleeping next to your car, maybe we should talk about sleeping in your car. Ooh, the long-held Japanese tradition. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is something that you will see a lot in Japan, and it's. I think it goes to something called inemuri, which we've talked about before, which is sleeping on the job, because you'll see a lot of a lot of construction workers or businessmen who get their who get their bento boxes, their box lunches, and they'll yep. eat that, and then they'll just pass out in their car. Right. But you also see this at nighttime as well. Now, Japan has some very, very strict rules about drinking and driving. Like, you could have just washed your mouth with Listerine, and if the cop picks you up, you're screwed. <laughs> That's kind of how it is. Like, even like the slightest amount of alcohol in your system, and they'll strip you your license, strip you of your license. You pay like a like hundred thousand dollar fine. It's something like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's something outrageous. Yeah. And then, like, you are basically blacklisted from working at any company after that for yep. having that on your record. So because they have such strict laws about drinking and driving, a lot of times if people go to a party or they go to, like, a Bonenkai or they go to their, um, what is it, Shinenkai. There you go. They, um, they will just sleep in their car until they uh, sober up and then they'll drive afterwards. So sometimes you'll see people just sleeping in a parking lot. Usually that just means they were out drinking the night before and they're trying to sober up before they drive home. You're right. Um, and just going off of the drinking and driving, um, even if you go to a wine tasting where you don't actually drink the wine, uh, it's recommended, I've read this on the Japan Times, I think, yep. um, where it's recommended that you don't drive for five hours after just to get yes. everything out of your system yes. even though you didn't drink anything yes i mean everybody metabolizes uh alcohol at different rates like they're 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 what is it the enzymes in their stomachs that break break it down but for most people between three to five hours but the recommended time that like the authorities say you should wait is five hours per drink mm -hmm. yeah so even even when I'm in Sendai or going out with friends and I have one beer, my wife will never let me drive. She will take right. my keys away. If I'm completely sober and completely fine, she'll, she'll take the keys away from me. Right. Well, for the rest of the night. Well, that, that's smart, of course. Oh, but yes. So, I mean, it's the same with my wife, too. If I have any drinks, she knows that she's driving. Yeah, yeah. Our, <laughs> our, wives, our wives are the smart ones, if right. you can't tell. Right, right. <laughs> So is there anything else that we can think of for driving that people should know about? Uh, we should talk about the international driving permit, how to get that. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, if you're in the United States, you can go to any AAA. And uh, going to AAA, I think it's $15? Yeah, it's I think $15, $20, yeah. $15, $20, you have to bring a specific size picture of yourself. Yeah. And then you bring your own license in with you and you get an international permit that allows you to drive in like... 30 or 40 different countries or it's, something like that? It's an that. amazing amount of countries, actually, yeah. yeah. And it's good for one year, but after you get it that one year, you can't re-up it again for another year. Yeah, so it's always recommended, if you do get the international license, to right away just apply for your license in Japan. Yes. Um, even if you've only been here for like a month or two, if you're going to drive, as we discussed, the to get your license is a lengthy process, so it's recommended just to apply for your license right, right away. Unless you're just planning on staying here for one year. If you're planning on staying here for one year and going back, that permit will do you just fine. Oh, but yeah. If you're planning on staying any longer than that, then you definitely need to uh, to start straight away on trying to get your Japanese license. Because sometimes that process can take months because you usually have to take time off yourself in order to go and uh, take the test because it's only from noon to one. Now, having your license and taking the test is all fine and dandy, but there's one thing we didn't discuss, and that is buying a car in Japan. Oh, yeah. So this is this is a fun <laughs> little 
<laughs> a fun little topic. Um, actually, where we are right now, we can see cars driving down the road, and there are two or three different kinds of license plates that you'll see. There are white and yellow license plates. No, There's also many green different and others. black. They're green and black. There yeah. are yes, there are. But Mo for the most part, you'll see the yellow and right. white. Do you know the difference? Yeah, the white and yellow means that that car takes unleaded gas. But if they're green and black, that means they take diesel. There you go. And they're also dependent on the size as well. If right. I'm not mistaken. If, if you have, if you see a yellow license plate or a black and or a yellow and black license plate or a black and yellow license plate. Uh, that's a K car, which means it's a 660 cc engine vehicle. If it is above 660 cc engine or cc, cc no. if it's above 660 cc's, <laughs> wow, that's a tongue twister. Come on, you got it. You got oh, it. Yeah, I got it. All right. <laughs> anyway, it'll be a white and green license plate, or a green and white license plate. There you go. And there's also a, um, a lot of different variations you can do with the license plates. Um, I've seen the ones that you can have that are, they're not vanity, but you can have them light up as yep. well. Um, the LED ones right. or something. And I think if a car is over a certain age, I think it, I think it's like 30 or 40 years old, it's a white license plate with a red line through it, meaning that it's a classical car. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just like back home where there's the vanity plates and the like in Colorado, there's the Pioneer plates and all this. They they have these for Japan, but they're just dependent on age and the size. Right. And you can't do you can't really do vanity plates here in Japan. No. I've never seen that because everything is numbered. There's no letters. So if you want to get they do vanity have hiragana plates, on the plates though. They do have hiragana. Do you know the system behind that? No, I don't. Uh, so how it's been explained to me is every car there's. So in the, on the license plate, you'll have the prefecture where you bought it, mm -hmm. where it was done, or the city. So if you, have a, if you come from a big city like Tokyo or, not Tokyo, um, like Sendai or s large cities, that's what will show up on the license plate. Then there's the number as well. And then there is a hiragana, so all the way to um. And so if you, those hiragana indicate the number of cars in Japan that have the same license plate number. So if you have ah, there's that means there's if it's like 5263 ah, there's only one other car with that number in all Japan. Right. E is two cars, and it goes all the way, all the way to mm. something something like that. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, so don't quote me on this, but something to that effect. All right. Well, buying a used car, it's kind of a crapshoot. But buying <laughs> a new car is, it's expensive. But it's really easy, and it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a build a bear workshop, <laughs> except for with buying a new car, it's build a car workshop. There you go. So I've never b bought a new car oh. in Japan. So yeah, no, my my that. my wife, right before we got married, she got into a car accident, got money from the car accident, and we went to buy a new car. Um, so basically, what happens is, is you start out and they you look at all the models and everything. You find out which ones in your price range, what engine size, and then they show you the base price. And then everything you want after that adds to that base price. So if you want the cool looking interior, well, you just added a thousand dollars. If you wanted what navigation, you just added another five hundred dollars. If you wanted the supercharger, which my wife wanted in her car, <laughs> that's like another $2,000. So they start with your base model, and as you add to it, the price goes up. <coughs> Excuse me. So it is, in essence, a build a car. So you never go to a dealership and you go and look at cars on the lot at a dealership for a brand new car. If you're going to look for a used car, you would look at a lot of cars. Now, when you go to a dealership, there will be cars on the lot, but those are more for show, so you can look inside and see what it's like. Or they're going to be your test drive cars. Exactly. So they normally keep at least one model of most of the cars they have for test driving. Or they'll have a car that has like maybe a similar engine size or a uh, like uh, like is similar in. Um, what is it like size or weight or something like that so you get a general idea of how that car would handle 
Yep. But uh, other than that, um, like we were saying before, with the shock can, depending on how old the car is, if you're going to buy a used car, you may find a car that, you know, it's really cheap, low mileage, uh, what is a really great gas mileage, but you'll find out that the car is, you have to get shock can every year. So the price may be really low, but with the shock can will kill you. <laughs> Over, over a long period of time. So the theme of today's podcast is don't get a car. Ride, ride a bike <laughs> if you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, I think that's what we all we got for today. That is it? it, I think. All right. Well, we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. See ya.